Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bebley Minster and welcome to our service of choral evensong. And a huge welcome to the Chamber Choir of George Heriot School in Edinburgh. Very privileged to have them this evening. I heard them a little bit this evening and I think we're in for a treat. Beautiful. Our responses this evening are by Thomas Ebden and the canticles by Charles Villiers Stanford in C. My name is Catherine and I'm a licensed lay minister here at Beverly Minster. So please remain standing if you're able to sing our first hymn, number 422, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice into the throne of the heavenly grace, saying with me as you sit or kneel. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no help in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Grant, we beseech thee, merciful Lord, to thy faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve thee with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm this evening is Psalm 149, and if you'd like to follow it, it's on page 536. You may sit for this.
Our Old Testament reading this evening is taken from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them round your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart, so you will find favour and good repute in the sight of God and of people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh, and a refreshment for your body. Honour the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My child, do not despise the Lord's discipline but be, or be wary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves the one he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding. For her income is better than silver, and her revenue better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Happy who hold her fast are they. Here ends the first
Our New Testament reading is taken from, <clears throat> excuse me, the first letter of John, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, that he is re- when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin, because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin, because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. For this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. Here ends the second lesson.
standing to affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. grant that thy Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Light in our darkness we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our anthem this evening is Come Down, O Love Divine by William Harris.
What a beautiful introduction to prayer. Um, I should say that this beautiful choir are joined with our own Beverly Minster Choir and combined, combined they do sound really wonderful. So let us pray. As we pray tonight, I'm sure the situation in Israel and the Gaza Strip is very much in our minds and hearts. So please join me in prayer. Almighty God and Father, help us to be still in your presence, that we may know ourselves to be your children and you to be our God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, we bring this terrible situation before you and ask for a swift end to violence. Our hearts are breaking for the children and families in Israel and Gaza who have and continue to experience the unspeakable horrors of attacks and war all around them. We pray for peace and ask that you will guide the hearts and minds of those in leadership. We especially pray, Father, for those children who have been physically and emotionally injured for those who've lost loved ones, that you will provide the right people with the right resources to help them, and that you will protect each person. Lord, we ask for your wisdom for all those involved and for the wider international community. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray for the church and for its ministry. Renew your church, O oh God, for mission and service, and make it here and everywhere a living fellowship of the Holy Spirit, revealing your love to the world, reconciling people to you and to one another, and serving all who are in need for the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, we continue to bring your world to you and ask for mercy for all the broken and divided places. We pray for all who bear the bewildering responsibility of government amongst the nations of our world. Give them all wisdom and guidance and integrity in all their dealings and a resolve to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness for all. We pray for all who suffer as a result of war and disaster. We bring to you the ongoing war in the Ukraine. The people of Libya, Lord, still suffering, and the people of Morocco still suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray for all those in need tonight, all those who suffer in mind or body or spirit. We pray for those who are bereaved, who are in pain, for the dying, for the lonely, for those suffering for any reason, Lord. And we bring ourselves and anyone known to you in a moment's silence and name them before you. <clears throat> In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, rejoicing that the dead as well as the living are in your love and care, we remember with thanksgiving and again silently name before you our loved ones gone before us. Amen. And we draw our prayers together by saying the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. <clears throat> Please do stand if you're able for our next hymn this evening, hymn number 313, Lord of All Hopefulness. 313. <laughs>
pray that my spoken words will reflect the written word and lead us to the living word, to Jesus Christ. Amen. I know that some of you here tonight will have heard me say before, some of the choir certainly will, um, that it can be difficult to understand a passage when all we get is a little chunk in the middle. I've always thought it was like picking up a book in the middle of it and, and trying to make sense of it. And often we have readings like that, that begin with a, bit, uh, with a but or a then, and we know we've come in halfway through a much longer passage and we really do need to put it into context. Tonight's reading's a bit like that. Sounded very wordy, I thought, in the middle. Only we're coming in and reading from the middle of a letter. And for it to make any sense, just as any reading, we have to know some of what came before. So let's start by looking at who wrote the letter and who it was written for. The first letter of John was written by John the Apostle, one of those original twelve who had walked and talked with Jesus, seen him heal, heard him teach, watched him die, and had met him risen and watched him ascend. Written from Ephesus, probably between 85 and 90 AD, John is an old man, possibly by now the only survivor of the original 12 apostles. It was written, we know, before he was banished to Patmos, where he was to live out his last lives in exile, and probably write the Revelation, the last book of the Bible. By the time of John's letter, Christianity had been around for more than a generation, and it had already faced and survived severe persecution. Jerusalem had been destroyed in AD 70, and Christians were scattered throughout the empire. This letter is untitled, and it wasn't written to one particular church. It was sent as a pastoral letter to several Gentile congregations. So in effect, it was addressed to all Gentile congregations throughout the ages, including us tonight. Now, it was written because the Christian community were having trouble remaining in fellowship due to significant differences in their beliefs about Jesus. You might be sitting there thinking, well, who's ever been in a church where there hasn't been differences? Hands up. There wouldn't be many hands up. All churches have their differences. All people in the churches. But this was different. This was as a result of serious false teaching. And this is where we have to understand that we've come in halfway through John's letter. Because if we, read, if we read the whole of the letter, it's clear that in tonight's reading, John's in the middle of addressing some of those false teachings that were causing division. I just said that John's letter was for all generations, including us. And we don't need to be the, the victims of false teaching for that letter to have some value and some messages to us. As an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry, John was qualified to teach the truth about him. The original readers of this letter hadn't seen or heard Jesus for themselves, but they could trust that what John wrote was accurate, just as we can. So let's look at what John addresses in this chunk. And next week will be a sort of part two to this, to tonight's message, because next week's evening service, um, the message follows straight on, which doesn't happen very often. One of the things he writes about is the issue of sin. The heretics, that's the false teachers, were denying the reality of sin. But John says in verse 7, look, sin is real. Don't let anyone deceive you in this. And if you continue in it, you really can't claim to belong to God. He goes on to say, the children of God do what is right. Puzzled over these verses a bit this week. And I thought, you know, the Christian life is a long process of becoming more and more like Christ. And it won't be complete until we see Jesus face to face. But here's the difference. There's a difference between committing a sin and continuing to sin. Being born into God's family, being his children, means that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, renewing our hearts and minds, and that we should begin to think and act differently. We don't make a practice of sinning. We don't continually choose 
to commit a sin or to do wrong. Because as Christians, the very minute we repent and say we're sorry, we receive forgiveness. We don't carry on doing the same thing over and over again. I think it's a really wordy, that that chunk in the middle, it was a really wordy verse about sin. But we have to be clear, you know, we don't continue to do something when we know it's wrong. Not if we love God and we know that we are his children. We try our best not to fall into the same sin. John then writes about love. And actually, it's one of the primary reasons for him writing this letter, to help put believers back on track, to show them the difference between truth and error. But also, and and a lot of his letter is taken up with this, to encourage the church to grow in genuine love for God and for each other. John knew that love was the glue that held the church together. It bound the people into one family, just as it does now. So, John tells them, look, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. You've heard this before, over and over. You should love one another. And he echoes Jesus' teaching that whoever hates another person is a murderer at heart. And then he sort of, to prove his point, he takes it right back to Cain and Abel, where Cain's lack of love for his brother, together with his jealousy and his jealous anger, drove him to murder his brother. Cain Cain harbored that hatred in his heart. So John is reinforcing that Christianity is a religion of the heart. Outward compliance alone isn't enough. We can't just go around pretending to love God and to be a Christian. We're not going to fool people for very long. God wants more than that, more than outward compliance from us. He wants us to be genuine, sincere, and to love from the heart. I want to say more about this next week, so I'm going to leave love there, and that will be part two. But I do think it's, it's, it's the most important thing of the whole Christian message, and this whole mess that's happening in the Middle East, you know, there is only one solution, and that is love. I'd like to close tonight, though, by going back to the very beginning of what John wrote um, in this part of his letter. In verse 2, he wrote, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. It's quite a wordy passage again, but basically... John is admitting he doesn't have all the knowledge, all the answers, just as none of us do. And that's why I was so pleased that some of my very favorite Bible verses were part of our Old Testament reading this evening, because they address that lack of knowledge and that understanding that every one of us has. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. Some translations read, do not depend on your own understanding. Does it sound like a cop-out? Too simplistic? I don't think so, because we're God's children. John uses the term throughout his letter, and as children we can trust in God our Father for all the things we don't understand. Because this, after all, is the definition of of faith. Amen. So, if you are able, please do stand for our next hymn, um, our final hymn. There will be a collection during this hymn. It's hymn number 321, but we are going to be missing out two verses. Let me just check which ones they are. 321, Love Divine. 321. We're missing out verses three and four.
Peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen.